Sunday, our church continues its celebration of the Lord's resurrection of the Holy Pascha by commemorating, in particular, some very special individuals. The myrrh-bearing women, and also with them, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Now, who are the myrrh-bearing women? We actually have a whole list of possibilities, and the various Gospels may differ slightly here and there. For example, we read today in Mark, who was it? Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Josie, and Salome. But we also might see Mary the mother of James and Josie as a description, or also Mary, wife of Cleopas. And there were others with them, it also says, so it leaves it completely indeterminate. Who are these women? We read in Luke chapter 8, well before the events of the Lord's passion, crucifixion, and burial, that it came to pass he went through every city and village, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. This is Luke chapter 8. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come, who had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others, who provided for him from their substance. So, these were some of the women followers of Christ that could have been amongst the murderers and likely were. We read in Mark 15, there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Josie, and Salome, Mary the mother of James and Josie, it's very likely the Virgin Mary herself, and Salome could quite possibly be the mother of John and uh, James and John, the uh, sons of Zebedee. These were women who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. In Luke 23, we read, the day, That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew near, and the women who had come with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. And then they returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath according to the commandment. So these were women followers primarily from Galilee, all of whom had been personally touched by the ministry of Jesus, and in return for the service that Christ had done for them in healing them, in freeing them from the evil spirits that had taken over their lives, they in turn gave up their time and their treasure and their talents to minister back to Jesus. The word there in Greek is the uh, which is related to the word diakon or deacon. So in essence, these are your prototypes of the female diakon that we have. And it says that they ministered to them or provided for him and them, so not just Jesus, but the entire retinue of the 12 disciples from their own substance, from their own financial resources. So they were women who were, they were not hangers on, they were the bankrollers of this operation. It may seem unlikely to us, but that's exactly what it was. Maybe they were wealthy widows, perhaps. Maybe they were independent women themselves. It was not unheard of. The virtuous wife in Proverbs is a woman who can provide for herself if need be. She is an entrepreneur. She is a hard worker. She is somebody who gives back who the husband is proud of because she is a, a force to be reckoned with herself, financially speaking. And so they are capable of providing for Jesus from their own substance. And that must not have been easy to do. Think about it. How would you like to take two years out of your career two and a half maybe, if you started early with them, and follow Jesus around the countryside and his 12 buddies and help pay for all of their meals and all of their needs, their clothes, their shoes, and so forth. How many of you could afford to do that? It wasn't like following, you know, the dead back in the day. People would go follow the Grateful Dead on tour and they'd live on the back of their vans and sell t-shirts or whatever 
crunchy food at the shows. I have I knew people who did that. I never did it myself. They said, no, you should come. No, thanks. But uh, this was even a bigger operation in a sense than that, because you have to really provide everything. <coughs> and even after having done all of that and watching their beloved rabbi, the one whom they hoped was the Messiah, the one they believed was their Lord, to watch him suffer the shameful death of the cross, and then to watch him be put into the ground to be buried. They nonetheless did not lose their resolve to minister to him, but continued in that activity by going and preparing the fragrant oils and the costly spices so that they could anoint the body of Jesus. They, in fact, uh, though Mark 16, which we just read, says uh, that when the Sabbath was passed, they bought spices that they might come and anoint him. It really assumes that they had already bought it the two days previous, which is what it says in the other Gospels. Because why? Verse 2, very early in the morning, before the rising of the sun, really, on the first day of the week, they came to anoint him. So they already had it. They already had it prepared. They didn't go at 3 in the morning, knock on the door, and say, I open up, I want to buy some myrrh and aloe today. So into this also, we have two other figures that we commemorate. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Who are they? Because they're not part of the retinue. They're not part of the twelve. The twelve who followed him from Galilee are nowhere to be found at this point. Where are they? We talked about it last Sunday. They're hiding. They're afraid. They don't have... They don't have any money that they can use to go hide themselves or buy a ship somewhere. So they're, they're on the run. They don't have any power. They don't have any privilege. They don't have any position or prestige. They're really quite themselves in trouble. So there are two other men who come forward who are going to minister to Jesus to do the things that the Twelve could not do for them. And so we read in Mark, as we did today, when the evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. And so Pilate marveled, is he already dead? Okay, take the body. And so it then says, he gave granted the body to Joseph, and Joseph bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, observed where he was laid. So this is a remarkable figure. His generosity is quite exceptional. It's financially, of course, very costly. I think I mentioned this last week. This was a brand new tomb hewn out of the stone, wasn't uh, just a grave dug with shovels, but something that had to be hand carved out of the, the stone areas. And if you've ever seen there, you know, the archaeologists are finding these places. It's not just like a niche. It's an entire chamber excavated out of the stone with different rooms even. And this was a brand new one Joseph bought for his family so that he could, you know, have this everlasting remembrance, this rest with the saints. And so he takes that tomb, which was meant for him, and completely offers it up for the sake of Jesus. But it's also costly to him. It's also extremely risky to him because he outs himself as a follower of Jesus by coming before Pilate very publicly and asking for the body and showing this incredible kindness to Jesus. He is clearly identifying himself with the disciples of Christ. He's putting his entire position and authority and standing in the community and so forth completely on the line. But he does it anyway. And it says he also wrapped him in fine linen. Not just whatever could have done the job, but he gave him fine linen. He risks everything and offers up so much to minister to the Lord. In the uh, Gospel of John, we also hear besides Joseph, there was another person who helped him in this process. We read in John 19, 39, Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, 
also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as the custom of the Jews is to bear it. And there it says, again, in a place he was near by where he was crucified, there was a garden, in the garden, a new tomb, in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was close at hand. Nicodemus was also somebody who had something to lose because he was only coming to Jesus at night. That means not publicly, not in the public area of preaching, where he could be identified, but he came secretly. So he was a secret disciple, as many were. So by helping Jesus, he also puts himself at risk. And perhaps because of his timidity throughout the rest of Jesus' ministry, this time he makes up for it. What he lacked in courage, perhaps, he makes up for in generosity. And so he brings this mixture of aloe, 100 pounds, 100 pounds of myrrh and aloe. That's, that's more than what most people can easily carry. Maybe if you took two on your shoulder, you could do it. This would have cost quite a great deal as well. Not everybody got to be anointed with the murders and the aloes. Some people got just a little, you know, just enough. And the purpose of this was not to embalm the body of Jesus. The Jews did not embalm. That was an Egyptian practice. And even though you could say there were many Jews in Egypt and so forth, they were not embalming Jesus with all this stuff. They were just anointing him. And the only reason that they anointed the body of Jesus was why? What happens to the body very shortly after it dies? It smells. It starts to smell. There's a specific chemical that, by the way, called cadaverin, which is generated by decaying corpse, unique to the decaying corpse, and it has a very distinct scent. And once you've smelled it once, you will always recognize it. It is the smell of death. And all of that myrrh and all of that aloe was to cover up the smell of death. So if you were lucky, you got a little bit to kind of, not that anyone was going to necessarily come by or anything, but, but even so, even through the stone, even through the earth, maybe somebody might walk by and smell that eking out through the cracks. So it was out of, in a sense, it was love, but at the same time it was kind of shame. We don't want our Jesus to smell, that's what they're saying. We don't want our Lord to stink like anybody else. So we're going to load him up with as much as we can. And really what he had was a king's worth, a kingly treasure of myrrh and aloes to stave off the corruption of death. They did not know that that was not necessary. In fact, in many ways, what we can see here, though, nonetheless, is a beautiful fulfillment of the psalms. There's a specific psalm that we that we sing, and often it's it's sung at different times of the year in the church, uh, remembered in association with uh, feasts of the Mother of God, uh, feasts of the Nativity, and so forth. But actually, it's very very appropriate here. And that's Psalm 45. In Psalm 45, starting at verse six, we read this: "Your throne, O God, is forever and ever." The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God your God has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. All your garments are scented with myrrh and aloes and cassia, out of the ivory palaces by which they have made you glad. King's daughters are among your honorable women. At your right hand stands the queen in gold from Ophir. Listen, O daughter, consider and incline your ear. Forget your own people also and your father's house, so the king will greatly desire your beauty, because he is your Lord, worship him. And we think of that often in terms of how maybe the relationship of the Virgin Mary approaching him and the presentation of the, the Virgin into the temple. But also it's a beautiful image here of, of the myrrh-bearing women coming to the tomb. The myrrh-bearing women coming to anoint him because they desired his beauty. 
because they desire his love. They leave their father's house, that is the father, the, 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 the house of the destitute, faithless religion that they had been following for the true way that Christ had presented them. And they desire him, and so they come, because he is their Lord, to venerate him, to worship him, to anoint his body. This was not the first time that women would show such love and such devotion. Last week I mentioned to you uh, Mark 14, when Christ was in Bethany before his passion. He was at the house of Simon the leper, and as, it, as he sat at table, it says, a woman came with an alabaster flask full of very costly oil of spikenard. And she broke the flask and poured it on his head, so there was no going back. The whole thing was going to be used. And some of the disciples were indignant. So what is this waste? Why are you wasting this? And Judas, who knew the count of the money, right, was among them. He said, it might have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they criticized her sharply. 300 denarii. Do you know what a denarii is based on? Denarius, or a single denarii, a denarius is basically equivalent of one day's wages of, say, an unskilled labor. So you're talking 300 days of unskilled labor. Say, if we were to put it at contemporary figures, maybe $100. $100 times 300 is $30,000 worth. 30, in American dollars today, $30,000 worth of costly ointments. So it was a big jar, and it was very costly. And Jesus could have said, yeah, yeah, you're right. We could have, we could have fed an awful lot of people with $30,000, with 300 denarii worth of this oil. But what did he say? Why do you trouble her? Let her alone. She has done a good work for me. For you have the poor with you always, and whenever you wish, you may do them good. But me you do not always have. She has done what she could. She has come beforehand to anoint my body for burial. Assuredly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will also be told as a memorial to her. And it's for this reason that the church also commemorates this unnamed woman of Bethany as one of the murmuring women. In fact, that's what it's beautifully sung in Holy Week in the hymn of Cassiani. When she, when she wiped her feet with her hair, she joined the ranks of the murdering women. All of these peoples went through extraordinary measures and extraordinary difficulties at extraordinary cost to minister to the Lord, to give good unto God. They are role models for us, of course. But we, in our own selves, in our own lives, we may think, oh, but isn't there better things I should be doing with all my time and all my treasure? Shouldn't I be storing it up and stowing it up? And shouldn't I come up with some brilliant plan somehow? And those are good questions. But we have to be honest about what's the motivation. What's the motivation? Do we serve the Lord? Do we offer Him with true love? There is a certain parable that the Lord teaches, and unfortunately it's not in our Sunday lectionary. It's read at a different day of the week throughout the year. And it really is quite useful, perhaps helpful, in this question. And I'd like to share it with you. It comes from Luke chapter 16, and it's the immediate preface to the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So keep that parable in mind. You know, the rich man who enjoyed all his wealth while the poor man was dying at his door. The parable he gives previous to that is this. There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account for your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my master is taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig, and I am ashamed to beg. 
So I'm no good at labor. And I'm too proud, too ashamed to go on the dole. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him, and he said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Just give me fifty back now. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. He said, Take your bill and write down eighty. Pay back eighty percent. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. He brought back some of what he owed his master, but more importantly, he leveraged the debt to his own benefit. Because why? Once he lost his job, he had people now he could call in favors from. That's what that's about. He leveraged his, his situation, even in difficulty. For the sons of this world, says the Lord, are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. Take your lesson from worldly men, he's saying. They can be shrewder than you. You can learn something from them. And he says, and I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, by filthy money, that when you fail, you, they may receive you into an everlasting home. Leverage your situation. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will you give for what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and men or God and riches. So that's the parable from that culminates in that. This is really important. What the Burberry women did and what Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus were doing was very similar, actually. Because they knew that they were only stewards of what they had been given. They knew that they were in actually incredible debt to their master and their Lord. They knew there was nothing they could ever give back to Jesus for what he had done for them. And so they wisely, shrewdly leveraged what they had and the situation that they were in to do good unto Jesus, to show some faithfulness in small things in the hope that they would have an everlasting home to go to when the time of their stewardship would be over. Because brothers and sisters, all of us, our stewardship has a beginning and an end. Every single one of us have been entrusted with something that did not come from us and will not remain with us. And that is this earthly life. And everything, all the blessings that we've been given and all the good things and all the wonders that we've beheld and all the joys we have been able to experience. These were gifts, and they were given to us by our master, not to waste, not to put to no good use, not for simple selfish enjoyment, but so that we might be able to use them to do good later on, to leverage our debt to God, to do good to others. The Burberry women understood that. And they did that. Joseph of Arimathea knew that the tomb of his body was of no value compared to the everlasting home of his soul in, and his body in the resurrection for that matter. So it was as nothing for him to give away that brand new tomb. He knew that the clothes on his body were as nothing compared to the raiment that he was seeking to have in the kingdom of God. And so it was as nothing for him to give fine linen, the finest of linens to wrap the body of the Lord Jesus. And Nicodemus, who had once been timid and afraid, knew that there was nothing by which he could wash his own soul and take away the stink of his own decay and his own corruption because of his fear and his cowardice and his half 
measures of faith that he had previously shown. And so he gave as much as he could to wipe away the smell of decay so that it should never touch the body of the Lord Jesus so that the body might be properly washed and anointed for the tomb. Brothers and sisters, let us make sure that we are doing the same with our lives. Let us make sure that we are preparing ourselves just like that woman in Bethlehem. Let us do a good work unto Jesus so that what we do may stand as an everlasting memorial to us. Let us love the Lord Jesus and not be ashamed to show him. And in doing so then, the whole purpose of the blessings we've been given will be revealed. The whole, bless, the whole purpose of why we have all the things that we've been given will finally make sense. Because honestly, without it, without that purpose of giving, we were given so that we could give, not so that we could keep. In the giving of gifts to others, on the generosity, to, sh to give thanks to the generosity of God, only then does any of that stuff mean anything. Only then does any of it matter. Only then does it really ever find any lasting value. Otherwise, what is it? It's just somebody else's trash at the end of the day. That's all it is. Somebody else's trash. Through the prayers of the myrrh-bearing women, of the righteous Joseph, the noble Joseph, and the good Nicodemus, Lord Jesus Christ our God, have mercy on us and save us. Christ is risen. Adamasikan. Christus is risen. Christ is risen.